Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on this week's show, we check out that brand new 24 inch wheel Canyon street bike. There's a crazy linkage carbon fork. There's another crazy linkage fork and more great stuff for you guys. Okay, well, first up, um, the elephant in the room. As you see, Henry's not here this week. He's actually having some holiday time. Uh, and as you can probably guess, we've had a bit of a delivery. A little bit too much to move out of the way, so I feel like I'm in a store cupboard. But uh, straight into news first. And um, as you can see on the screen right now, um, we're talking about Fabio Vibner's new bike. So he's signed for Canyon. We've known this for a little while now, and he released an incredible video of him riding in Israel. I think if you want a tourism video basically to be made, Fabio Vivna could be your man from now on. I think it's an astonishing video. It definitely makes me want to go there for a ride. But more importantly is his new street bike. So he's quite famous for riding quite a lot of street, not far off the sort of style of Danny McCaskill. And of course, both of those riders use those inspired 24 inch wheel street bikes. Danny since is now riding for Santa Cruz and he's actually had a carbon Santa Cruz bike designed specially for him to mimic that exact bike. And Fabio's done exactly the same and he's got this brand new Canyon prototype as you can see right here. Got no special details on the bike other than they're teasing the picture. It's got those Continental 24 inch tires that Danny famously uses on there um, and we want one. We desperately want one. We want one for lunchtime games of bike. We want one for learning new skills. It just looks amazing. Um, if you'd be interested in purchasing one of these bikes yourself, let us know. Would you like a street bike like this for, for playing around and developing your low speed skills? Next up is linkage forks. And this time, yes, again, we're talking about the trust forks. Although this time, not necessarily a bicycle fork. Now, scouring the internet just to see what was going on. I've been following Cake motorcycles for a while. Well, they're not, they're not fair to call them Cake, actually. They're electric, full suspension bikes. They use an um, electric motor, clearly, but they're not resembling a mountain bike. They're somewhere, they sit somewhere between a motocross bike and mountain bikes. Now, you might have seen Sam Pilgrim's video where he's absolutely tearing the back end of one around the UK countryside. Very cool bikes, but this picture here, check the fork out on it. So the original one had a bit more of a telescopic fork, a bit more conventional approach. This is what appears to be a trust fork, like a Dave Weigel fork. Uh, so it's got all of those things that a trust fork is famous for. It's got its own three shaft dampers in there. It's got its own air leg. It's got the linkage design, a trailing link, of course, which is famous to make the fork ride the way it does. And interestingly, in the comments, Dave Weigel actually piped in and said, uh, just to quote Dave, once a moto guy, always a moto guy. And after riding Trust for five years, there's no way I'm going back to the old stuff um, if I can do anything about it. Luckily, I've got the skill, the will, and the means to do something about that. Welcome to the future of the future, I guess. So perhaps Trust have a bigger plan than we first thought. Watch this space. Now, if that wasn't already strange enough on your eyes, prepare yourself for this single leg carbon fiber linkage crazy beast of a fork uh, on the screen right now. This is it being operated by its owner. It's the Rock Sled Suspension Fork, but it's actually manufactured by Carbon Wasp. Now this fork is a pretty impressive thing. So first up, you'll notice clearly it's a linkage fork and it's using a rear shock in there as the damper. So it's just a linkage fork with a damper on there. It's 160 mil travel, fully made of carbon fiber and it's a single leg as well. So it's basically pushing the boundaries of everything that you possibly can with a bicycle fork. So some facts on it, it's got 160 millimeters of travel. Of course, you can see that shock on there. It's got that same sort of dynamic um, offset principle that you see on other linkage forks like the Trust. So basically the uh, offset changes from 45 to 17 millimeters, which basically suggests that the trail increases as you go, as you compress through travel. So the fork gets more stable, not less. So it really requires you to sort of disengage your brain to relearn how to ride and recalibrate yourself for this sort of thing. Uh, it's got 200 mil brake mount on there. And of course it's got anti-dive properties because it's a linkage style fork. Um, super interested. I don't know much more other than what I've just scoured through their Instagram page, but I'm desperate to get in touch with them and I'm going to do so after this show because I think there's some really interesting stuff going on in mountain bike suspension at the moment. We all know that telescopic forks are a mass market and they're very good for a reason, but I can't say that I'm not interested in the, the linkage stuff because it's really, well, it's quite different. What do you guys think? Do there, any interest in the linkage stuff? Is it unnecessary? Or do you like the fact that it's being explored to genuinely try and find something better? Uh, let us know in those comments underneath. 
Okay, so next up in news, thankfully, is back to normal bikes. And this one is the new YT Jeffsy. So first up, we know that YT offer great value bikes, and a lot of their bikes are quite gravity orientated. Uh, the Jeffsy, of course, is available in 27.5 and 29 inch wheels. It's a 140 mil travel frame, and you get it with either a 150 or a 160 fork, depending on the smaller wheel or the bigger wheel. Now, the cool thing about this is it's a new aluminum frame. It's got new reach, it's got new geometry, slightly more refined, slightly more modern. And this build, as you can see on screen now, it's got SRAM 1x12, it's got RockShox Yari fork on there, and it's got the Deluxe uh, Select shock even on the back there. Um, incredible value, less than 2,000 English pounds. So that is phenomenal for the money. Absolutely a hell of a bike. I'd imagine they're probably flying out the door as we speak, if they've got any left. Um, but I know where I'd be putting some money if I had uh, that much money to put on a bike. I think that is phenomenal. Nice one, Whitey. <laughs> Okay, so now it's time for Bike Cave. You know, a cave, the bike, the place where you store your bike. Uh, it could be a workshop, could be under the stairs, it could be a proper work stand like the one you probably, oh, you can see just out of shot there. Um, it could be like my workshop at home that I was lucky enough that I could build myself. Uh, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Wherever you keep your bikes, take some pictures of it. Tell us all about yourself. Tell us about your bikes. Tell us what you love tinkering with the most and send your pictures in to that link right there at the bottom of the page. First up this week is from John and he's from uh, Victoria in Australia. I've taken over the back room to store my two bikes and gear. I live out, uh, live out of a toolbox because it holds all the gear I need. The Marin is my daily commuter and the Polygon is my trail hack. Nice setup. I love the fact that you can like double decker the bikes at the back there. It's a really efficient use of space actually. I mean, I've got my bike sort of racked up vertically on the back wall of my place uh, and still it does sort of encroach on your space, but I can't physically get a better use of space, but if I had two, I'd do the double decker. I think that looks great. And you've got a nice airy shelving on the left hand side there. Looks like you've got some sort of what bike or some sort of training bike in the foreground there and a work stand as well. So you've actually crammed in quite a lot into a small amount of space. A workshop, um, workshop, workbox, toolbox, workbox, workbox, we'll go workbox. Um, looking good, Trojan, absolutely loaded with stuff. Nice effort, John, thank you for that. Uh, next up is over to Oregon for Thomas. He's got a 2017 Felt 980 and his son rides a 2019 Pitch Expert. I've just finished adding another workbench and storage for parts. This is the sort of place I love. The longer you look at it, you start seeing all these extra things like a uh, ski sports badge there, the Pepsi Cola retro sign on the back there. Uh, all sorts of good gubbins going on. Decent sized bench as well, nice working space. Good light in there as well, actually. So it's got some retro sledges up the top there, some flasks, some ski boots, all sorts of stuff going on. I'd love to have a little rummage around a place like this. Loads of good stuff. Nice work. Awesome stuff, Thomas, thanks for that. Uh, next up is over to Jochen in Germany. In October, I bought my first mountain bike at the young age of 55. Dude, welcome to the club. Uh, always good to have another fellow biker on board. Following the purchase, I turned my workshop in the cellar of our house into a bike cave. I enjoy it very much to be here. And in amongst these cool photos of the said bike in the workshop, which I've got to say is a really decent workshop, looks like you must be pretty handy with your tools, judging by the amount of non-bike tools you've got in there and your motorbike. Awesome stuff, thank you for that one. And now over to Christchurch, or should I say down to Christchurch, or is it Christchurch in New Zealand or Christchurch in the UK? You haven't specified, uh, but this is from Aidan. It says Tottenham Hotspur Football Club, so I reckon you might be from Christchurch in the UK. Dolly and Henry, I've been watching your show since the very beginning, absolutely love it. This is my bike cave setup. I'm constantly trying to think of new ways of improving it. I'm currently sitting back with a cold beer in my cave, catching up on the latest episode of Tech Show. Good man, thank you very much. Good speak you got in there as well. Is that a Bang & Olufsen or something? But that sounds decent in that little space. Uh, love your units, by the way, they're really nice. Are they dedicated workshop units or are they like a kitchen units? Can't quite tell from here, but looks really good. You've obviously got your pain cave set up there with your fan in front of your turbo bike. I like it, I really like it. In fact, I'll go as far as saying it's my favorite one yet. Uh, definitely on this week's show. Definitely over last week's show. Got some skis as well, looking good. Rubber flooring, ah, ground anchors, good man. Always pleased to see that, you've got to lock it. Don't want to lose that stuff. I mean, unfortunately, some people are going to take it, whatever happens, but um, you can do your best to make sure your stuff is secure. But uh, awesome. Also loving that darts board. Thanks, guys. See you next week. Okay, it's time to go fakey and get some rewind action going on. This, of course, is where we 
look back into yesteryear of mountain biking, uh, where it all came from, where it started, and is why we've got such good stuff now. Uh, so I kind of like sort of looking back at that stuff and paying a bit of homage to it. If you've got anything old, even if you think it might be junk, it's probably not, and it's probably something I'll love. Um, so take some pictures of it and send it in. There's a link right there. So first up this week is from Joseph in South Carolina. Hey Joseph. I just finished watching what I now realize is a nearly to date year old version of GMBN Tech. And I got very excited when you pointed out Jason McCoy's S-Works FSR, as I happen to have one sitting right behind me. Oh man, what a bike. Um, oh, heavy dose of nostalgia here. I figured this might be a cool bike for Rewind and I should send it in. Yeah, rightly so. I uh, bought the bike in 2000, 2001 ish and rode it hard for several years before shifting to more aggressive downhill riding. The bike as it sits is still 100% functional and original. Well, as original as it can be, less the brake pads, chain, etc., like consumables. It's interesting to me the differences in the more modern bikes I now own to what I rode and what was available in the past. You know, the long stems, narrow bars, the sketchy brakes. Um, I know a lot has evolved, but if we would change three things on this bike today, it would make it a lot more comfortable pushing it down the trails. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. I think um, anyone that hasn't ridden in that era, actually, I mean, it's a beautiful bike, but I just want to emphasize your point here. I don't realize what it kind of used to be. Like most mountain biking was like crisis management. It was never a case of like, put your Strava on and see how fast you can ride down something. It was more a case of, do you reckon you can get down that? Um, and let's face it, with your saddle up your ass and uh, massive long stems and tiny little bars and brakes that barely work, it was 100% crisis management. And some people were much better at dealing with the crisis than others. Uh, Jason McCroy was one of them. He used to just go into stuff flat out and just deal with it. Um, and usually came out the other side. Uh, here and there had a bit, bit of a crash, but um, super nice to see this. So that's got the Specialized FSR fork on it. So Specialized over the years have dabbled in suspension quite a lot, um, as well as being you know kind of pioneers, I guess, in the full suspension realms uh, by using the horse link on there, which was famously called the FSR link. Uh, that obviously it was designed by Horst Leitner, who designed the AMP research, of which I've got that B2 that I'm gonna build up. Um, they've been in it from the beginning and they've dabbled in loads of different suspension designs on the front end. And of course, different options on the rear, different shock absorbers that they've designed and they've had built by Fox and RockShox and other brands. Uh, but that was one of the nicest looking for. So I love those slender lower legs on them, really nice looking. There you go, there's that linkage, the FSR linkage and even the graphic there that says it, classic. Oh, lovely looking bike. And see so you've got a pretty new stumpy in the background there as well. But very nice to see, thanks for that. Uh, next up is from James. This is a Mountain Goat Jules. Um, Mountain Goat Jules made in Chico, California. Uh, potentially one of the last ones. Uh, the brakes are from Paul's Components, love those. It has a Manitou EFC fork. That was their downhill fork. Look at the fork you can see here. This is ridiculous. So you've got this on a hardtail bike, which is clearly not a downhill bike. That was a Manitou EFC um, I think it was a Manitou 3 EFC, is what it was, the DH fork. A friend had one, had three inches of travel. And they were around about the same time as when the Judy DH came out. I was so jealous of that, because I had the Mac 5, uh, which had two and a half inches of travel. Um, probably worked better, to be fair, than that, but that was way nicer. Um, lovely to see the Mountain Goat, though. They had one of the coolest bikes of all time, didn't they, Mountain Goat? They had um, Whiskey Town Racer, I think it was called. Lovely bikes. Really cool to see, and uh, I love that head tube badge as well, with a mountain goat on there. Wicked stuff. Oh, and there's one last one as well. This one's from Nathan on the Isle of Wight. Uh, I'm not sure on the bike. I saw this in a bike shop in the Isle of Wight. I remembered uh, you spoke about the dual disc Marzocchi on the tech show. Wonder if you could tell me anything about it. Dude, I wish you took a better picture of this bike, because I know exactly what that is. That is a Spooky, but I can't tell if it's a bandwagon or a metalhead from this angle. So Spooky were made by, well, actually they're welded by Frank the Welder. Uh, spooky Cycles from, um, I'm gonna say Brooklyn, probably wrong now, I think they're from Brooklyn, New York. Um, dirt jump bikes, they were iconic, absolutely cool as anything when they came out. You ran them with a four inch travel fork, it was pretty much always a Z1, and the later incarnation, which was the dirt jump specific forks, or dirt jams and dirt jump, dirt jumper one, two, and three, etc. Uh, yeah, so that is the original Marzocchi Z1 bomber on there with that Cullimore Engineering dual disc, and it looks like by your brake levers, well, by the brake levers on the bike, it's a hope, uh, brake lever on the rear. ODI grips, got one of those Tioga downhill saddles and it looks like it's got a set of Eastern Cully pedals on there and the uh, Tioga tires. Oh, I'd love to see this bike. I'd love to see some better pictures. Any chance you go back, take a few more. Um, and it, by chance, is it at White Max? 
Um, I think that's Blake's local bike shop. If that's the case, get some pictures of it. That thing looks mega. But uh, thanks for sending it in. Great to see. Okay, now it's time for top mods. And this, of course, is all about the modifications and the customizations. You do your to your bikes, basically, the modification station, if you want to call it something weird like that. Um, anything you've done, take some pictures of it, tell us about your bike. Tell us why your bike is better than the rest, because you've personalised it to you. Show us what you've done, take some pictures and send them in. Now this week is a really, really cool one. So this is from Mark, and you might notice his handlebar setup is a bit different to usual. So I'm going to read this out word for word. It's from Lincolnshire. Uh, this is my top mod to my brake lever. To give you some background, I was born with no fingers on my left hand, just a stubby thumb, and at four years old I had a toe moved from my foot to my hand and my thumb extended. On my road bike it's been easy to get brakes set up without, uh, with a problem solver one to two cable splitter, but on my mountain bike it's been a bit more difficult as no one makes a one to two hydraulic splitter to work both brakes off. As a kid I would only ever have a rear brake and just skid all the time rather than go over the, brakes, uh, go over the bars. So that's how I've always ridden. But now with how little effort it takes to operate a hydraulic brake, I've just put the lever the opposite way around so I can push the lever rather than pull. Um, Mark, I think this is amazing that you're riding, riding your mountain bike full stop. You're riding your mountain bike with this setup and your ingenuity to just flip that lever the other way. But I have got a really cool suggestion for you. In fact, I've got two cool suggestions for you. Um, granted, they cost a little bit of money, but it might be something that you wanna look into. Now, earlier in the year, in fact, last year, I forget we're in 2020 now, we made a couple of really cool videos with a guy called Tom Wheeler. Now he's actually got a paralyzed arm that happened from as a result of a bike accident and he actually runs two brake levers on one side of his bars. Uh, so you can see that in this image here and he's basically got a little clamp with a sub handlebar in underneath so he can run one lever underneath and use basically these two fingers to control both brakes. It's a really effective system and I don't think it would take very long to get used to it. It's an amazing video. Please watch both of those videos and you'll get an understanding of how he rides the bike and how he's managed to do the setup. The bike check, I'm going to put in a link underneath this and then that will also take you through to the documentary all about Tom. Uh, and if anyone else hasn't seen that, please watch it. It's really good. And what that guy can do on a bike is staggering. You must see it. And incidentally, he's actually got a really cool video dropping on iTunes anytime now called All Right But. Um, it's a Welsh special, basically. It's going to be really cool. Uh, so get involved with that. But more importantly, another suggestion for you along the same lines is Hope, the British company that specialises in hydraulic brakes, actually make a dedicated single bracket lever and it's got two blades and it can control two brake calipers. Again, it can be used on the right side or the left side of the bars. So in your case, it will be on the right side of the bars. It means that you wouldn't be using your left hand to do any braking but you can do all the braking with your right hand. And I assume that you're probably a dominant right hand, um, so you'd have a nice strong hand, in which case you use both of those two fingers to control your brakes. Of course, it would mean you'd need to invest in a set of those brakes. But it's definitely worth considering, because I reckon if you're riding a bike like this, if you can get that setup dialed, you'll be absolutely smashing it on trails. Um, but way to go, Mark. Um, I applaud you, man. Keep riding, it's so cool. And I just wanted to add in one of my own top mods. Um, I'm ashamed to say it, but kind of pleased to say that I've set myself up on Zwift. I did make a video on how to get your mountain bike set up on Zwift, but I actually wanted to not have to use my mountain bike on it. So I basically bodged together a bike from some stuff that I've been generously given and some bits I've been laying around over the years. So I've actually had this white Saxon Cross cyclocross frame. It's a bit scuffed up and it's a bit dinged and dented in that, but it would have been perfectly good to ride. Uh, it's been in my loft since 2013, uh, which I can't quite believe. So I finally got this built up borrowed, well, stolen a wheel from GCN, they'll never know about that, because um, I don't watch our videos today, clearly. Uh, and also I stole one of their stems as well. And the handlebar came off an old bike here that's been laying around, and again, pretty much got cobbled it together, found an old cassette, the chain is one that's kind of worn out, but it'll be fine on Zwift for a while. Uh, bent rear derailleur, bent it back into shape, Happy days, it's all good, the indexing works good. The only problem it would have had is on a mountain bike style cassette, we've got a bigger range uh, with the road one, where it's very close ratio, it works perfectly. Uh, the only thing I had to buy was a front derailleur and a chain set. So I bought a Shimano Tiagra one, it's the cheapest I could find. Uh, just got that online and cobbled the bike together. And that is it, that is my dedicated bike where I just wanted to just go and smash out an hour on the turbo when I haven't got much time. Um, I'm quite pleased with it. Anyone else got a little pain cave bike? If you have, love to see them, um, link them in to the show. 
Okay, now it's time for tech of the week, and you might notice something obscure hanging off the bottom of my chainstay. Right there. So that is the Archer Trail D1X. Uh, and also, if you look up on my handlebars, you'll notice it's not got a conventional shifter and there's no cables in between it all. A little bit of magic here for a bit of a DIY wireless transmission here. Now it's kind of cool because it uses your regular conventional derailleur. So you haven't got the expense of a crazy expensive derailleur that you might cry if you smash it off, for example. But what I wanted to draw attention to wasn't just the fact that this is a wireless way of shifting using your conventional setup on your bike. Firstly, it's quite cool, but secondly, it can be really useful for people with unusual bikes or ways of riding. Now, I actually seen this being used by slopestyle riders quite a lot who didn't want the cables in order for doing bar spins and tail whips, but they still want to be able to change some gears. Now, of course, there are some limitations to a system like this. It's got batteries on it, which means the batteries need to be charged, and you do have to sync it, and then you have to set the gears up in a different way because you adjust the electronic trim through this slave unit that basically controls the cable. Um, it's very simple to do, but it is something you have to keep on top of. However, it's really quite cool. Considering it's battery powered, it's actually pretty conservative. You're talking about 80 hours if you're using this thing constantly, and about 150 hours of use it takes um, in low power mode. It takes two AA batteries, which are supplied, they're rechargeables, and it takes a single AAA on the remote up at the bar end there. Um, I think it's a cool setup. You can use this on various different bikes. It might be quite appropriate on unique and obscure bikes that have issues with cable routing and stuff like that. And it's quite neat, makes your handlebars look neat and tidy. And if you're looking for something a bit different and a bit quirky, uh, I think it's fantastic. And a great way to get an introduction to this sort of tech and not have the expense of having to commit to going something as advanced as say DI2 or the wireless option, which would be SRAM Access. Of course, Access is top of the range stuff. This, you could use it with an SLX derailleur for next to nothing by comparison. Pretty cool, I think. Uh, there we go, there's another weekly GMBN tech show in the bag. Um, let us know what you thought of the tech in the comments underneath. Let us know if you loved it or hated stuff. Um, in fact, don't be too harsh on the hatey stuff. Just give us some comments either way. More importantly, give us some comments about this. See what you think of the Archer system. I think it's pretty cool. Now, I'm going to throw you directly to those Tom Wheeler videos that I mentioned in Top Mods. Uh, the Tom Wheeler bike check is right down here. If nothing else, you've just got to watch this. It's phenomenal what he's done to his bike and you would not realize it when you see him ride. The guy absolutely rips and the documentary is right down there. If you've got a spare 20 minutes, sit down with a cup of tea and watch that. It's really, really good. As always, give us some love, give us some thumbs up, give us some comments, hit that subscribe button and hit the bell. Ding, ding.